Well, to get uh, some more information on this uh, promising success, we've asked uh, uh, Shabir, Professor Shabir Mahdi, who's a professor of vaccinology at the Wits University, to join us. He's uh, on Skype. Thanks so much indeed for joining us, Prof. Uh, welcome to the program. Just how significant is this uh, news that we've received today? So I think this, uh, this news is really great news. Uh, it's a phenomenal uh, it's a phenomenal success uh, in terms of what they've done, uh, and it certainly has exceeded expectations. Uh, many people were hoping for the first generation of COVID-19 vaccines to perhaps have 50 to 60 percent uh, effectiveness. And what we've got at hand here is a vaccine that has got 90 percent effectiveness. And what's really important about this vaccine is that it uses novel technology that has never previously been utilized to develop a vaccine. Tell us a little bit about that uh, technology. So this is what is known as a messenger, messenger RNA vaccine. And essentially what they've done, if they've taken a genetic material that codes for what is known as a spike protein, which is an important component of the virus that allows the virus to attach to the human cell. They've injected this genetic material into humans, into the muscle, and the muscle cells itself has used that information from the genetic material to produce this protein, the spike protein, which is then presented to the immune system to elicit a response, including antibodies. So they're basically almost making use of the whole cell as a machine to actually manufacture this protein, which we're wanting to develop antibody against. My goodness. So... Um, it's the, the, the trial isn't over yet, but they already are quite confident with the numbers that they have. But what isn't this test telling us? Because I'm sure it doesn't tell us the whole story. Sure. So what they still need to do is uh, accumulate adequate data in terms of the safety of the vaccine. And what the regulatory authorities have requested is that at least 50% of the study participants need to have been followed up for at least a two-month period before they would uh, consider a licensure of the vaccine, or at least to have the vaccine used under emergency circumstances. So they haven't yet reached that uh, milestone, which is probably expected to occur by the end of November. The one issue about this vaccine, uh, especially in the context of South Africa, is that the storage requirements of this vaccine needs for it to be kept at minus 70 degrees Celsius. Wow. Now, unfortunately, from a programmatic perspective, uh, very few low middle income countries, and in fact, very few high income countries, have got the infrastructure to store vaccine at minus 70 degrees Celsius. So unless Pfizer is able to take this vaccine to the next step and allow for the vaccine to be stored at temperatures of two to eight degrees Celsius, the ability to roll out this vaccine at mass scale is going to be limited. All right, so um, we're not quite sure also, I guess, about um, how long you stay immune or is it, you know, one shot, three months, four months, and this will take time to unpack? Uh, correct. So the, the durability of protection is something which is unknown and these study participants will need to be followed up uh, probably for another two to three years uh, to determine whether there's any breakthrough events in individuals that have received at least two doses of the vaccine. Uh, as was mentioned, for this particular vaccine, it required two doses, which are spaced about three weeks apart. Uh, so it's probably going to be some time before we can establish the durability of protection. But based on what they've shown in terms of their immune responses to the vaccine, coupled with its effectiveness, I think there's good reason to be optimistic that we would have a vaccine that would form at least as well as natural infection in terms of inducing immunity, which we estimate will probably be for at least two to three years, if not longer. All right, so suppose in a situation like this, especially because we've got a, a global pandemic that's taking lives, we can't wait two or three years to get the final story. We've got to go with what we know uh, is working. Sure. I mean, uh, I think it would be foolhardy not to adopt this vaccine as soon as it becomes available, if it becomes accessible. Uh, but like I said, for this particular vaccine, and unfortunately, I think there's little chances 
of it being rolled out in South Africa mm -hmm. simply because of its storage requirements, as well as the reality that much of the vaccine that will be produced in the next six to 12 months, in a sense, it's already been spoken for by high-income countries that have made an advanced market purchase of this particular vaccine and a few other vaccines. All right. Um, help us understand how these trials work, because you're trying to prevent people from getting COVID-19. How do they figure out um, who got it and had the placebo and who got it didn't have the placebo uh, and it worked against them getting it? Right. So the way the studies are conducted is what we call randomized control trials. And uh, volunteers are randomly assigned to either a group that receives the vaccine or a group that is the placebo, which is sort of an inactive substance that won't have any impact against COVID-19. Neither the participants nor the investigators actually know which person has received the vaccine or the placebo. And we continue following up these individuals. And over time, it's a natural course that people will become exposed to the virus if the virus is circulating, and some people will end up getting infected. So the way the studies are designed is that once you've reached, reached a certain number of cases of COVID-19, at that point, you can do an analysis in terms of seeing what is the difference in percentage or the attack rate between, of COVID-19 uh, between those that receive the vaccine compared to those receive the placebo. So as an example, if there were 10 cases and nine of those cases occurred in a placebo group and one case occurred in a vaccine group, then you would have a vaccine efficacy of about 90%. Oh, okay, so the idea is you've got two large groups one taking the drug, one not taking the drug. In theory, if both were allowed to uh, live normally, they'd have the same infection rate. And the differences in the infection rates is as a result then of the, uh, the use of the drug. Exactly, I couldn't summarize it better. <laughs> okay, all right. So then what do we look forward to then? I suppose it's the other... Uh, drugs that are being developed, uh, perhaps the Oxford study? Right, so there's two other studies. In fact, there are three studies that are currently underway in South Africa as of uh, Friday. The one is the Oxford vaccine, uh, which we've completed the enrollment, and we're currently following up the participants, waiting for X number of individuals to develop COVID-19 before we can do the same sort of analysis. The second vaccine is a different construct, uh, which is developed by Novavax, a biotech company, which is also an extremely promising vaccine in terms of the immune response that it elicits. And we sort of midway in enrolling into that particular study. And the third study is a vaccine that's been developed by Johnson & Johnson, and they've just started enrollment into that trial as of Friday in South Africa. That is part of a multi-country, multi-centered study, which plans on enrolling up to 60,000 participants. So for all of these three vaccines, it's very, very likely that we will get some results in terms of whether the vaccines work in protecting against COVID-19 or not as early as uh, towards the end of this year or in the first quarter of next year. All right. So in terms of vaccinology in general, have we made leaps and bounds in terms of um, developing new technologies and understanding um, how to combat uh, viruses uh, as a result of uh, uh, these vaccines in development? Yeah, certainly. Like I mentioned, the mm. Pfizer vaccine uses a novel technology, and usually the average time period uh, from the time when a vaccine is developed in a laboratory to the time when it's shown to be effective in humans is about 10 and a half years. That's the average time that it takes to develop a vaccine. What BioNTech and Pfizer have been able to do is condense their 10 and a half year period into literally a 10 and a half month period. Wow. So that is a phenomenal success uh, and a huge uh, leap in terms of the frontiers with regard to trying to expedite vaccine development moving forward. So this is a first for COVID-19 and hopefully the same sort of technology will lend itself to other vaccines against other infectious diseases in the future. All right. So we were hearing stories about uh, uh, in uh, Eastern Europe, Min Minsk uh, supposedly carrying a virus uh, akin to COVID-19. What do we know about that? Because the concern then must be, 
if new strains are starting to show up, we may just have defeated one, but already starting a battle with another one. Sure, and I think that's a really important consideration. But fortunately, with the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which causes COVID-19, it is genetically much more stable than, as an example, seasonal influenza virus. So with seasonal influenza virus, during the time of circulation of the virus, the virus is already undergoing numerous mutations, and that's the reason why we're needing to vaccinate almost on an annual basis against seasonal influenza. With the COVID-19, with this particular virus, uh, the mutations are much to a much lower extent than for seasonal influenza. So we're fairly optimistic that vaccines probably will uh, still be successful despite some mutations evolving over time. Uh, in terms of what's happened with the minks, uh, is that they have identified a virus that has shown sub some mutation, but whether that amount of mutation is adequate to sort of circumvent the effect of the vaccine is something that's unclear at this stage. Uh, so again, an important thing that we would need to examine into the future as we start rolling out the vaccine, because just the rolling out of a vaccine itself could in sort of put pressure on the virus to mutate. And consequently, we can get another strain. So these are issues that are not unique to COVID-19 and is something that uh, only time will tell whether these are additional challenges that we might need to deal with in the future. All right, Professor Madi, always good talking to you. Thanks so much indeed uh, for explaining the importance of uh, this news that's come out uh, about this uh, 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 drug, this new one that's uh, coming through. Thanks so much indeed for your time.